talk about WordPress for nonprofits today. Uh, it's used a lot for building nonprofit websites. If you were in the last session, or if you're just familiar with WordPress, you know that part of the reason for that is price is right um, as a starting point, but also it's very capable. The, the ecosystem around WordPress is so large. And there's plugins for almost anything you can ask for it to do, and if there's not, there's lots of tools for doing your own customizations. Uh, whether you're writing code or whether you're not good at writing code, and you want a solution that doesn't require that. So I'm going to talk today about a little bit about WordPress and some things I've used with WordPress to help nonprofits. And also I'm going to talk just a little bit more philosophically about nonprofits and their audiences and how to think through who you're trying to communicate with and the journeys you want them to take so that you know what the website is on behalf of and what it's trying to accomplish when you then go try to populate it with content and build it. Um, I will be the first to tell you that um, the tool you choose, whether it's WordPress or anything else, is of secondary importance to your content and your message and that journey you're taking people on. Right? You can make the prettiest website in the world and if it doesn't engage anybody with its content, you know, they'll look at it for a moment and admire it and they'll move on. So uh, the other thing I'll mention is WordPress isn't the only solution and for some organizations that are really small and have no skills and no budget to hire anybody with any skills to maintain and take care of this thing, it may not be the right solution. Today in this conversation is the right solution is what we're going to talk about. We're at WordCamp. And it is what I use with most of my nonprofit customers. So I'm the founder of Lewis Studios. I provide marketing services from uh, marketing strategy through execution. We design, build, and operate websites for our customers. Uh, I also serve on the board of, of several nonprofits, a food pantry, a conservation trust, and I'm involved with a bunch more who are my clients. Uh, so my passion and knowledge of web design and, and, mission, and uh, development combined with how much I admire mission-based organizations sort of led me into this world of serving nonprofits as a pretty big chunk of my customer base. Uh, basically, I developed a website for my local conservation trust, and uh, after nobody had changed their content for seven years on their website, at first I helped them get access to it again, because nobody knew how. <laughs> and then we replaced their HTML website that nobody knew how to edit with a WordPress-based website, where anybody that can use a word processor can add a news story. Uh, and so we moved them quite a bit forward in that process, and as we finished, the town next door said, man, we need one of those, can we buy one? And they were good friends with some nice people over in Lincoln, Massachusetts, the Walden Woods Project, so they made a connection for me, and next thing I know, not am I, I'm not only doing conservation stuff on the website, but I'm also now building a, a library and collection management system for the complete uh, works by and about Henry David Thoreau. Uh, and so we got into museums, and little bit of library-like functionality there, and it's sort of the steamrolled from there. It's become a pretty big part of the business, but the conservation trust piece is a low-cost, repeatable solution that I can deploy over and over again for these small volunteer-run organizations with small budgets at a price they can afford. It still makes sense for me. Uh, so that's a big piece of my nonprofit experience, but also the food pantries and the museums and so forth. I've been using WordPress for about 10 years. Um, I've used almost everything that preceded it along the way, Plone and Drupal and a lot of hand-edited HTML and most of the HTML editors that have existed over the years. Uh, is anybody here completely new to WordPress? Is this weekend the first time you learned anything about it? Okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the, the basic basics. Uh, you're certainly welcome to contact me at another time if you want to talk more about that. I'll re-emphasize that your content does matter a lot, uh, more than the tools themselves, and that you know, WordPress is a content management system. Basically, it's separating the presentation of the content from the creation of the content to a large degree, but not as much as it used to. Uh, and it's making it easier for people that don't know how to write uh, HTML and the various styling things we do with CSS to still make a nice looking website and maintain it and maintain the content. One of the reasons that's valuable is because editing HTML is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not super complicated, but you know, if you had to write your, your word processing documents by seeing all of the codes that were in there and, and saying, I want this to be bold, so I'm going to put some special stuff around it, and, you know, it would take you forever. So it's much nicer to be able to just highlight something and say, make it bold. Uh, at the same time, when we used to write regular HTML, we had web pages that worked great for exactly one kind of viewing experience. A pretty normal size monitor on a pretty normal computer. But now, you know, visitors are arriving on these little tiny things, and that website on this little screen ain't going to work. Uh, 
And so we need things that help us respond better to whatever the visitor is doing. It could be screen size. It could be that they're operating by touch, not by mouse. If you're in love with hover effects, you need to end that love affair. <laughs> you can't hover on a touch device. Right? Uh, and so there's different things that we think about in, our, in today's world as we sort of design from a mobile first perspective. So I like to say it's all about the conversation. You start with your audiences. So who are you trying to serve? If you're an educational organization, whether it's an official school district or uh, I do some work with Acre Family Child Care in Lowell, Massachusetts, which helps uh, child care providers in the area educate themselves, become better business people, and connects parents to the providers so they get the, the child care that they need. Uh, those kinds of worlds, your audiences are often parents. And in the case of them, it's also providers or educators. Uh, so how do they find themselves in your world of content? If you are a conservation trust, then you have constituents who just want to find out about your trails and go for a walk. And that may be the beginning of their journey to becoming a different kind of constituent in the world. But you also have people who want to donate money. You have people who want to help build a trail. Uh, in fact, Eagle Scouts are always looking for a project and they love to call their local conservation trust. Uh, so where can they find themselves or read about something another scout had done? And so as you start to think about these different audiences, then you well, what is it that I want to happen as a result of them visiting the website? Do I want them to give money? Do I want them to go out and appreciate what I do by going for a walk on the land so I can later lead them down the path? Uh, do I want them to come by with a bag of food and drop it off at the food pantry or start a project? We have something called the Neighborhood Food Project. It's a kind of a nationwide movement now. A lot of food pantries are involved with it. And you basically, your neighborhood gets distributed a set of bags and when they go grocery, go grocery shopping, they buy some extra food, put it in the bag, and once every other month, the neighborhood coordinator comes around, collects all the bags, and brings us to the food pantry. Most of our neighborhoods uh, now are bringing about 5,000 pounds of food when they drop off. Uh, it's a pretty impressive program. Uh, so the whole town will do the same every 60-day cycle. We alternate the towns. We serve six towns in that particular pantry. It's soon to be seven. Uh, and so it's a wonderful way of getting those donations, but I need to educate people on what the program is, how they get involved, who they contact to get their bags, right? how do they organize their schedule for dropping off. So there's a communication process there. Uh, and it's not just your website. It's your social media presence. It's your email marketing. The best thing you can do with a donor who's not ready to give yet isn't say, goodbye, I hope you come back again. It's to get their email address. So you can tell them more of the story and build their confidence, build their trust, build their vision of themselves as part of the solution. And then eventually, you can ask them to give again, and you'll be at the point where maybe they're ready to give. And so it's, it's, it's not just that one-time thing. If we, just to take a look at some of what we've been talking about quickly, here's, a, here's the Acre Family Child Care website, and this has a lot of uh, development still to be done. Um, I don't know if they want me to tell you this, but they got hacked pretty bad before I met them. And actually, not before I met them, but before I was their provider. And so we've been having a conversation, but it was going slowly, as they often do with nonprofits. And um, so they called me up and said, I think we have to accelerate our decision making on this project. <laughs> uh, and I said, OK, what happened? And they said, well, we got hacked. And I took a look, and they were using a content management system that I had not used before, which is pretty rare. And I wasn't terribly confident I could unhack it. Um, and so I said, you know, Let's try this. What if we go to the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, and we just look at what your website looked at a couple months ago. Um, it's a pretty simple website. It's not a lot of dynamic content, so we can scrape everything right off the screen. Uh, and let's build your new website from that, get you back up and running, and then we'll build forward. So that's what we did here. Not a terribly complicated website, but if you look at the menu, there's the parents, and there's the educators. So, they can find themselves right there. They can also find themselves here. Do you need child care? Do you need to be trained? Are you educating children and you need some training programs that we offer? Or do you want to become part of our network? So some big calls to action right there on the web page. But some of these bring them right to a form that asks for a whole bunch of information. And that's how they've always done it. Um, but a lot of people aren't ready to give that much information at that point in the journey. So that's why I say we have more work to do on this one to sort of give them those intermediate options of, Maybe you just want to get some news from us when we're having training events. Just give me your email address. I'll ask you to become part of my network later and give me all your info, what certifications you have, and all that stuff. Uh, so maybe start slower. So, uh, 
pop back in here. So if you're familiar with WordPress, you already know this. For those of you that are less familiar with WordPress, at, at its core, WordPress is about two kinds of content, pages and posts. Right? Pages are the things that are typically in your menu. Uh, you navigate to them or you find them from links on other pages. Posts are your news stories, so they're in your news feed or your blog. Uh, and they're typically presented there. That's sort of the beginning, and from there we can certainly make it much more complicated and do many different things. And editing in WordPress is more like we're processing the coding, but the world keeps changing and we have more options now. Uh, and so there's three WordPress editing options, and then there's third-party things you can add in to do even more. So in WordPress, you always had the ability to use a visual editor that was a very word processor-like experience. And then there was another tab that said text, where you could see the underlying HTML, see the markup, and, and do more complicated things. When WordPress 5 came out, they added what's called a blocked-based editor. You probably have heard it called Gutenberg a lot uh, here this weekend. That's what it was called while it was being developed. And that blocked-based editor makes it a little bit easier to do more complicated things because you can drag in blocks to do things like a heading or a paragraph or an image. You can also do some very basic things with columns, um, which can be quite helpful. Uh, and so that was an advancement, but then sometimes you need really complicated page layouts, and that's where page builders come in. If you were in the last session, you heard Beaver Builder mentioned. Um, another popular one is Divi. The one that I use a lot is called Elementor, uh, and, there's, and there's more. And these things uh, bring a lot more widgets that you can make into your page and a lot more layout control if you need more complicated home page layouts. Just to provide context, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we don't have a lot of time, but here's a, a block-based editor page, right? So there's an image that was dropped into this column followed by a heading, followed by a button. Um, and, and you would link the button to your donate page in this particular case. Uh, and here's a different campaign over here. And if you wanted to add more content, you go down here and say, I'd like to add another block. Uh, here's some common blocks, a heading, some columns, a list, block quote. And depending on plugins you have installed, you may see other things down here. Here's my donation forms. Uh, here's my e-commerce stuff. This is a plugin I use a lot for custom content, custom views of that content called Toolset. And I can drop those things in as well. And so depending on what you're, you're using with your website, you may have more or less options for the blocks that can be dropped in. But that's the block-based editor. And then this is the Elementor editor. And you see I can easily manage background colors, background images, uh, typography. I can drop icons and things in, do my paragraph text, drop in a gallery. Um, but here's a form. So one of the widgets in the Pro version of Elementor is uh, a from widget, a form widget. And if I drag a form widget in, then I can edit its fields, determine what happens after it's submitted. So maybe I want to email that somewhere after it's submitted. And then set the settings for where it's going to be to uh, and either just take the blind send me all the fields from the form or format oops, I'm sorry, format a nicer message where I call out the fields individually and say so and so just sent this message to our website on such and such date and their phone number is if they'd like to know and then their message you know so you have that control as well not the world's most powerful form system it's not going to replace gravity forms or some of the other form systems anytime soon uh, but if you just need basics it's built right in there WordPress doesn't work without a theme. Uh, and so your theme is your very basic framework of how everything's laid out and presented. And WordPress comes with some of its own themes. There's other themes you can use. The last presenter talked about the Genesis framework. Um, I happen to use Generate Press a lot with my themes, um, the pro version of that, which is not very expensive. But the reason I chose it was because I had a bad experience with a previous theme that um, worked great, but people that made it made it in support of something else they did and eventually decided that they didn't need to do it anymore. And so I had to go to about a dozen customer sites and replace the theme with one that was being maintained and kept secure and uh, keeping up with the changes in WordPress. And it just wasn't that much fun. So I said, find me one that's used by like a million people that has very responsive technical support and that doesn't cost much money, but I know they're going to be around. And so I made that choice. But there's a lot of good themes out there. My advice with themes, plugins, or anything else you're adding to WordPress is Check and see how much it's used um, and how well it's rated and um, glance at its support forum and see if the answers to the questions come in a few days or a few weeks or never. Um, and then make your own informed choices. There's a 
media library in WordPress, you don't often go directly to the media library. Usually you're in uh, the editor working on a page or a post and you say add media and you select your media from there or you upload new media from there. But sometimes you just want to go look at the whole library or sometimes maybe you're working in a page builder like Elementor and you put a button in and you want the button to link to a PDF that's in your media library. Well, it's easy in Elementor if you are um, linking to one of your pages or posts to just start typing the name of that thing and it'll find it for you and it'll put the link in. Not so much so with your media library. So if you go to the library and you find your PDF, click on it, you'll see its, its URL there and now you can copy and paste that over into the link for your button or your whatever you're doing there. Uh, the other thing I'll just mention quickly about the media library, when you're adding media uh, images in particular to a post or a page, if you're adding a bunch of them and you want them to be nicely arranged in a grid and stay uniform in the page, adapt well to different size screens, it's usually best to insert those as a gallery, not as one, then another, then another individual image, so that you get the controls of the gallery for, uh, for managing that grid. And then if you want, you can add uh, lightbox plugins that will, when you click on one of those images, they open you know, the background of the screen darkens, so your focus stays on the image, and now you can use your your mouse or your arrow keys or your finger on a touch device to swipe and move back and forth through the slides in the slideshow that are the, slide, the images in the gallery, uh, which can be a nice experience for people. Where my sites start to look a little different than the out-of-the-box uh, sites that a lot of people build is there's almost always something a little bit custom about them. Uh, and I use primarily two tools for doing customizations in WordPress. One is called Toolset. I mentioned earlier, a tool set lets you build custom post types. So in addition to pages and posts, my conservation customers might have properties and trails. Uh, or my uh, Walden Woods project customer might have collections and works and subworks, right? The, the collection, the book in the collection, the chapters in the book, something like that. Uh, and so I use tool set a lot because it lets me not only build the customizations, uh, including the custom post types and custom fields and custom taxonomies, which are your categories and your tags. But it also lets me produce the output of those to show on the screen, whether it's a list of multiple of them or it's the single template for one of them with all my customizations included without writing code. Uh, advanced custom fields also let you build lots of customizations and it lets you put some of that on the front end without code through short codes, but some of the more complex field types, you end up usually having to write code to show. Uh, and so I don't use that one as much. I do on some of the sites that are really large and have a lot of volume and need super high performance, so I can control how I look those up and whether I cache some of that as a transient and do certain other things behind the scenes. But in many cases, I just uh, use tool set simpler for me. And Take a quick look here. So this is the writings of Henry David Thoreau. There's some content here that comes from this actual page in the site. But then down at the bottom of the page, there's a table of contents with all of the works in the collection. That's not written into this page by someone who edited the page. That's placed there automatically by a tool set view that says, find me all of the works that are children of this collection. Uh, right? So that gets put in automatically. And then if you click through to the work, going through my cell phone here, so this isn't super fast, but uh, here's the table of contents for the work, and these are all scanned documents of the original uh, manuscripts and things, so they're not all digitized into an HTML form yet, they are going to do that at some point, so the links here are to a PDF version of, the, of that particular uh, chapter or that book, and then some other imagery that's from the original handwritten manuscript, which is kind of interesting, kind of, it's not easy to read. So that's a, just a quick example of customization. In the nonprofit world, the other customization I do a lot is I'll build a post type called sponsor. And I'll use the title field to be the name of the sponsor. I'll use the featured image to be the logo of the sponsor. And I'll add a custom field for the sponsor's URL for their website. And now the admin or the intern or the whomever that's managing the website content, when they need to change the uh, sponsors for the organization, they can just go add and remove those guys and then they can, uh, or even keep them in case they think they might come back in the future, but decategorize them. So, you know, a lot of people use precious metals 
for categorizing their sponsors. You got platinums, gold, silvers, um, and, and so you can have one that is, you have a sponsor not be in any category for now, but not have to go find their logo again if they come back. And then what we do is we build the views that display them with uniform logo sizes, which is the bane of most nonprofits' existence, right? Um, we lay them out in a nice grid, and when you click on the logo, you go to their website, uh, right? So we do, we do all of that automatically so that the intern or admin doesn't have to get that right over and over and over again. They just provide the content, the rest takes care of itself. Uh, search is important as much as, so I mentioned earlier, and I'm going fast um, to get this all in, but I did briefly earlier say, think about your, your audiences and the journey you want to take them on and where they're going to find themselves in your website. And you're going to do all that hard work and you're going to get your menu and your calls to action organized just right so that the navigation is perfect for the audiences you're targeting and half of them are still just going to go right to the search box and try to find it by search. Um, so A, make sure search is easy to find on your website. And particularly if you have a lot of content, think about whether you need to enhance it. A lot of these nonprofit websites that I do use a plugin called Relevancy uh, so that the search results are presented by relevance, not just in a pure reverse chronological order like WordPress does by default. Uh, so they're more likely to find what they're looking for that way. But also, Relevancy has the ability to log all the searches. And there's a tremendous amount of intelligence to be gained by looking at what people search for on your website. Maybe you did a lot of work and you organized everything just the way you thought it should be based on who you thought the audiences were and how you thought they would find themselves, but it has nothing, no resemblance at all to how they're searching for themselves and the content that's relevant to them. So you can learn from that and maybe start to organize things a little bit differently if you know what they're searching for. Now you can get some of that from Google Analytics as well. If you set up that tracking on your website, you're seeing what people are going to over there from your, their searches, uh, but I find it much easier right there in the blog. Other sessions have touched on this, so I want to spend a lot. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there's owned media and there's earned media. Your website, you own. Right? You own all the other content that's there that might distract them from the content they're looking at right now. You don't decide today, I'm going to show them this content, and tomorrow I'm not because somebody else paid more money. Very unlike social media. If you want to get seen on Facebook, it's fleeting. You can pay for it through ads or sponsored stories and things. Um, and you can get followers who might see your content if they interact with you a lot, but eventually you might fall off their radar because they've been interacting with other people more. And so, generally speaking, my advice is simple. Use social media to bring people to your website. Don't feature your social media on your website as a linkable thing to lead them away from your website to the world of distractions. Because when I get to Facebook and I'm reading the post that you had featured on your website over there, if I finish reading it, I'm probably never coming back. That's what my friend had for lunch. This is where my cousin went on vacation. You know, there's 10,000 other things vying for my attention there. So in general, as much as we all are not, nonprofits have small staffs and not a lot of people to write content, and it feels like a big time saver to post once and show in many places by just embedding that feed on your website, it's not as good for your search optimization. And it's going to take them away from you and maybe not ever come back to finish the journey you wanted. So, up on that, um, just be thoughtful about it. And the last piece in this section is, is from an operations perspective, one of the reasons I said earlier that WordPress might not be for everyone is because it's not completely self-maintaining. Plugins get updated, vulnerabilities get found, and in the open source world, the great thing is it's easier to find vulnerabilities, report them, and get them fixed. But the bad thing in the open source world is it's easier to see what the vulnerabilities were. And so if a plugin or WordPress itself or a theme gets updated and it fixed a big security problem, it doesn't take very long for all the bad people to know what the security problem was and go start trying to exploit it. So we have to stay on top of things and apply updates to the, the things that are making our world work properly um, in order to stay safe and secure. And in some cases, just to be compatible. If WordPress does a big major new release and they deprecate an API or something changes a little bit, or even if they fix something that worked one way and nobody knew it was supposed to work that way because the documentation said this, but a lot of people did it, uh, you know, something could stop working. And so if you're not in a position as an organization to do that kind of maintenance yourself and be able to run a second copy of your site where you can test the updates before you put them on the live site to see if anything's going to break, it's not a bad idea to hire somebody that can 
or to go out and gain those skills. There's a lot of good education around WordPress, so I'm not saying you have to hire somebody like me, but you gotta make a choice there. Either learn how to take care of it or get some help taking care of it. Don't choose option C, which is hope for the best. Uh, that is not a strategy. So some nonprofit considerations. So if you did a good job with that audience segmentation and understanding are you serving parents and teachers or are you serving donors and volunteers and those facing food insecurity or you're serving um, admirers of art or, uh, or readers of books or whatever your audience might be or uh, professional organization, etc. And you sorted that out you said, I think I need to speak to them by role or maybe I need to speak to them by something other than role. Maybe I need to speak to them by the action I want to want them to take because the nature of why you would go to my website is to do something uh, and so I need to find what those opportunities to do something are. Whatever that is, uh, you're now going to start to organize your content and the journeys through your website around that and you're going to want to be sure that at the end of those journeys and along the way the right calls to action exist. Uh, content that's highly engaging is called entertainment. Content that's highly engaging and inspires action and provides the opportunity to take the action is what we want for our nonprofits. Whether that action is a donation or it's participation in our event or it's uh, coming and getting the services that you need that we offer, right? That's where we want those journeys to wind up. And so be thoughtful about that as you organize your content. So a couple of quick examples. Uh, some land trusts might organize around the events they offer, the audiences to a certain degree, donors need to be able to find a way to donate, but more importantly around the properties and the trails. Uh, that's what people tend to be looking for when they come to the website. Whereas the food pantry might be around the roles, right? The clients, the volunteers, the donors, but also a little bit of action because if you want to donate money to me right now, I don't want you to first say, well, I'm a donor, and then go learn about being a donor, and then you know, three pages later, get the opportunity to donate. If you already know you want to donate, skip all that and please click the button and donate. Uh, that's okay. A historical society might be around the goods in their shop and their historical documents. Uh, so it really depends on the organization. That's why you need to be thoughtful about this. I can't just say, here's the answer. It'll work for all of you. That's not how it works. But my call to you is to give it some thought and study it and then measure. It's a never-ending journey. This is not, I wrote it and it's good forever. Your audience will change but also you might not have got it perfect on that first try. Now, nonprofits, many nonprofits, rely on the generosity of donors to fund at least part of their mission. So the quality of your content mission and how well you run your organization are important as part of that, and they're really important to things like grant writers who want to come learn about you before they issue that grant. Sometimes that's by telling them in the application the same thing your website says. Sometimes that's become they, they come visit the website and learn it there. But for individual donors, it's really about how smooth is the experience. So I have worked with nonprofits who, where I met them, did not have an online donation capability. Those were pretty easy. I could guarantee them I was going to raise their online donations. Um, I've also worked with nonprofits where I got to their website and they were a membership type organization. Um, so a lot of conservation trusts are quasi membership organizations. They're not truly membership, um, but they do their fundraising through membership. So do you want to be a friend of the trust, a benefactor, a supporter? They have different levels with different prices associated with them. And then they'll put you on your newsletter list and send you some stickers for your car and, and let you be proud to say you're a member and they'll remind you next year at the same time to give again. Um, great. I've met conservation trusts whose donate process was there was a big yellow PayPal donate button at the bottom of the page. Above that was a description of their membership levels and the suggested donations for each. Click on the button and you get over to PayPal and they hope that you remember how much the level you wanted to join was so you can take the dollar amount into the empty box. That's not a smooth experience. So one of the plugins I use a lot is GiveWP. Uh, you find this uh, just by searching for Give in the WordPress repository or by going to GiveWP.com. And Give lets you make very nice donation forms. For your basics, it's free. They do have um, add-ons you can buy individually or in a bundle that do higher end things like recurring donations. So I want this much every month for a year or two years. Um, they do fee recovery. So uh, here's the donation and based on our math, you're probably going to cost us $3 in credit card processing fees. Would you like to make it whole and give us the whole $50 if you pay the $3? Um, which is remarkably effective, as it turns out. So are recurring donations. If I was going to give you $100 today and you give me the option of giving you money every month, I'm pretty likely to give you $20. Here, that's more than twice as much money. Right? So um, those are oftentimes worth the money if you think you're going to have a volume of online donations. 
donations to make it worth paying a couple hundred dollars for the add-ons. They also have one for tributes, so in honor of and in memorial of, where they'll collect the honoree um, name or the memorial name, and then also put a notify, and any message you want to provide for us to use when we notify them. And they'll even print cards that you can send uh, to do that with, or you can do it by email, so it's fairly hands-off. They send also the, donor, the donation acknowledgement for you by email, and the do once the donation is complete, they send the receipt by email, which takes a lot of workload off of the administrative staff. Uh, however, they don't process payments themselves. So they, at the end of the day, you still process the payment through PayPal or Stripe or one of the other payment gateways, and that's a good thing. As small nonprofits, we never want to be in the business of PCI compliance, right? the payment card industry compliance for handling secure customer data, and we I just don't even want to be in the business of having to know how it works. And so, and, you, and frankly, you don't want to have to pay for the level of hosting plan it takes to be PCI compliant. And so by leaving that stuff over on PayPal or Stripe servers, we save ourselves a lot of headaches. Uh, but when they land over there, let's make it easy. All they have to do is provide the credit card number and finish the job, right? Not remember how much to type in. Or with Stripe, they don't even leave your website. They are paying through Stripe, not your web server, but in their browser, the Stripe part of that process appears right in the middle of your page, so it's a very seamless experience. And in the most recent update to give, the Stripe payment gateway became free for the basic donations. It used to be a paid gateway, so that was a nice change from them. That wasn't something I said. Uh, so just quickly, if we look at... Here's a donation form being edited in Give. Uh, I can go in and put my donation levels here, so individual at 25, family at 40, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I have the opportunity to add custom content to the form if I need to. In this particular case, there's no custom content on the form because it's embedded in a page that already has the content on it. But the end result is I have a donation form embedded in my page that makes it very easy to give. Here's the membership levels. I can choose my level and go finish the process. I also have a gift to a permanent fund here. Another feature of Give is the thermometer, the progress bar. So I'd like to raise $100,000. I've got $7,600 so far. Um, this thing is gold. So when you're $7,600 out of $100,000, it may not happen. But if you are trying to raise, say, $10,000 because you need to get a bunch of work done in advance of seeking a grant to buy a piece of conservation land, you've got to pay surveyors and assessors and lawyers along the way, um, when you get to about $8,000, something magic happens. Somebody wants to be the person to ring the bell, and they give you $2,000. Uh, no lie, I raised $15,000 in a week this way um, for a conservation acquisition project. And every November, I raise between fifteen dollars and $20,000 in about a week or a week and a half to buy turkeys and hams for our Thanksgiving and holiday dinner distributions. Because storing 400 turkeys and hams is not easy to do. <laughs> So if we can buy them just in time in the right assortment of sizes that make sense, it just works much better. And we've moved our donors from giving us frozen turkeys to giving us the money to execute with. And everybody's more effective. Their dollar buys more meat at our prices. Uh, and we, get, we don't have to store it. We don't have to go. We can go to Kimball's in Westford because they don't sell a lot of ice cream in the winter time. So can we borrow a freezer? Uh, now we don't have to do all those things. All right, let's wrap up here. Uh, donation forms. Calendars, I use a plugin called Events Manager. There are a lot of good calendaring plugins action out there actually. And you can embed other calendars, like a Google Calendar, for example, and, and other calendars as another way of doing this. But with the Events Manager, um, if you think of posts as being news, so you can always show those in reverse chronological order, newest story to oldest story, <coughs> events are kind of opposite but different. So events are always the next one that's going to happen, and then all the ones after that, meaning, don't show me the events that already happened. So leave those out of the screw out of the page. But show me the next event and the next event and the next event. So they're sort of forward chronological, but there's a little filter there that says, well, starting with today, not starting with yesterday or earlier. Um, and event plugins are all about doing date math. Right? They know how to say a week from now is this, you know, <laughs> and all the different things. That they, so rather than try to build that all with a custom thing or something, it's just easier to use theirs. Um, there's lots of ways you can display. This one happens to be in a sidebar on an older site. I don't do a lot of sidebars anymore because mobile, but um, there's lots of ways to do that. And events calendars are often very important to nonprofits. 
uh, volunteer pages. So if a potential volunteer arrives on your homepage, where do they go to learn more? And can they find it? Right? So is there a clear volunteering menu entry or call to action or both, um, if that's an important part of your organization? And when they get there, do they learn what it's like to volunteer with the organization and what some of your needs or what the opportunities for them to volunteer might be? Uh, right? And then can you get them to sign up? Can you nurture that lead? We may be a nonprofit, but we still need to nurture our leads. And so if somebody says, I'm interested in volunteering, Maybe I then take them to a forum where they can tell me a little bit more about their availability and their skills or interests. And now I can send them a pre-written series of emails over the next couple of weeks that say thank you for your interest. I understand you have these skills. Some of our opportunities that might be relevant for you, for you are these. Right? And I can move them along and say, you might really be interested in the story of Tony, who's one of our volunteers. And this is what Tony does and what he has to say about it. I'll show him a video clip and take them through that journey. And when they get further down, now I'm going to, my call to action towards the end of that journey is come on in for an orientation session or call me up to schedule your first volunteering time. Right? So I'm engaging them. The single worst thing for a nonprofit to do, and a lot of them do it unfortunately when it comes to volunteers, is to have a, an enthusiastic, gleeful volunteer walk in the door ready to help, learn a little bit about your organization, and whether the door is physical or your website, doesn't matter. Then go away and nobody ever engages them again. You've lost them. And these guys really wanted to help you with your mission. Uh, so a little bit of follow-up, which can be automated, goes a long, long way. And speaking of forms, there's other uses for forms on your website as well. Contact forms, of course. Uh, you may have forms, obviously, for donations, as we saw earlier. Uh, so for your simpler forms, that might come from your theme. They might provide a contact form. It might come from your page builder, as we saw with Elementor earlier. But if you need more complicated forms, often you're going to then look for a forms plugin. I have been used Gravity Forms a lot, and also WP Forms in some cases. Um, Gravity Forms is not free, but it's a very, very capable form system. Uh, you can do quizzes with it, surveys. You can do multi-part uh, forms so you don't overwhelm them until they've answered the first three questions. They don't see the next three questions, that kind of thing. And also conditional things. So based on the answer to this question, I'm going to ask you this question, not this question, right? and those sorts of things. You also may have a mailing list provider, a MailChimp or a Constant Contact or uh, Active Campaign or Drip or many of these solutions out there, and they may provide a form for you you can embed in your website to get those signups. If you need to store the entries for the forms, you probably will end up with one of two solutions, either a paid forms plugin in WordPress or embedding an outside form solution in the page like a Google Forms or a Google Forms or Type Form or one of those types of things. Most of the free plugins that go in WordPress to do forms do not store the entries on the server for you. They email them to you. And so don't lose the emails. <laughs> Last quick thing, if you're putting your archive of all your newsletters on the website, there's two things you want to think about. Um, one is, if all you're doing is providing links to PDFs, nobody's ever going to know which ones they want to open. So take a moment and make a brief table of contents um, about that issue so I can see if that's the one I was interested in or not. The other thing that you can do with your PDFs is in WordPress, when you're editing, uh, I'll just edit this page in the interest of time. If you're editing a page in WordPress, over here it says <coughs> published on, and you can edit that. So if you're putting your historical archive of newsletters into your website, give them their proper dates. They'll appear in the correct order. They won't, if, you're, if you're putting them in as regular posts, they won't, cloud, they won't cloud all of your news out of the top of your news feed. Right? You can manipulate time here uh, for your advantage. You can also do that with news posts if there's one you want to keep on the top of the list and your theme doesn't support the sticky posts feature, for example. Uh, having said that, be a little bit cautious because you are sort of lying um, if you change the time forward to cause it to appear at the top of the list. And if the date of the actual piece of news is really, really important, you might not want to do that. Um, if you didn't know, you can also manipulate th that date to publish things in the future. So if you're going on vacation next week, but there's something that really has to appear on Tuesday, publish it now and give it Tuesday's date. As long as somebody visits your website on Tuesday, it'll show up. Uh, so that can be uh, handy as well. And... So WordPress can be made to do just about anything a website needs to do. It does require some work to keep it up to date and secure. So, and also, you want to have backups. Right? And you want to know that the backups are usable. So 
So it's one thing to get a backup done. It's another thing to make sure it's being stored somewhere that isn't equally vulnerable. So in other words, don't store your backups on your web server. If your web server gets hacked, your backup probably isn't safe. Um, they need to live somewhere else. And you need to test them from time to time. So build an offline copy of your website and restore the backup and make sure it works. Uh, technology we talked about are just tools. They're, and they're not necessarily the best tools. They're the I, tools I happen to use. So I'm happy to share what I do with you. Uh, but at the end of the day, your content and those conversations matter much more than the tools we choose. And your website needs to integrate with your rest of your conversation, with your rest of your marketing. So it's about your public relations, your email marketing, your social media presence non-digital marketing, paper newsletter that you send out twice a year. Uh, it's not a standalone project. So I hope I gave you some things to think about in terms of how you might use WordPress um, in your nonprofit or use WordPress more in your nonprofit if you're already using it. I used up all of my time, so I will commit to be at the happiness table out there after we officially end here if anybody has questions for me. Also, if you want a copy of the presentation or uh, an ebook that is basically the script for the presentation, just come see me and give me a card that has your email address on it or something, and I'll, I'll shoot that off to you. So, thank you very much for your time.